All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. This is day two of our series on forest insects. Uh, before I turn things over to Glenn to get started, I just want to touch on those same logistics as usual. Uh, please make sure that you do switch your chat so it's going to everybody and not uh, just the hosts and panelists. I noticed a few folks uh, didn't do that yesterday. We want to make sure the chat gets recorded. Uh, for folks that go back and, and watch the recordings. And speaking of, those are going to be available on this website. Um, so bookmark that. Yesterday's recording is up there. If anybody missed that, um, you can go and, and catch that there. And Glenn, are you on? Are you back? I am back in here. All right, perfect. Well, then I will stop sharing and turn things over to you. Okay, I'm getting the host disabled screen sharing warning. That's my fault. I should have done that before. This is good. Your co-host now and my Wi-Fi has gone down twice today. So, <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, hopefully that doesn't happen to me. Yeah. Worst uh, case. All right. So let me know if you see some. Yep. Whoops. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with the first slide. How's that? Uh, looks good. There you go. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, good afternoon. My name is Glenn Kohler. I'm a forest entomologist with the Forest Resilience Division and Department of Natural Resources uh, out of Olympia. I cover uh, the whole state of Washington and provide technical assistance to state and private landowners and do uh, forest insect monitoring. Uh, and reporting on on conditions and trends. And um, so these uh, the series, if you weren't here yesterday, is focused on Western Washington. Um, and today we're going to be talking about management of the bark beetles, um, primary tree killing and secondary bark beetles that we talked about yesterday, the identification and biology of those. Uh, so these pictures here are, are some of the things I'm going to cover today, different uh, ways of um, managing bark beetles in Western Washington. And all three of these uh, relate to one major bark beetle species in Western Washington. Um, and if you want to make a mental note of which one you think this is, um, when I get to that uh, part of the presentation, I'll try to try to remember to see how you did. Okay. Um, so since this is west side focused i i want to make sure to put some you know put out some of the major differences here um because really there isn't there's some overlap between eastern and western washington so for example douglas fir beetle uh is, is a major pest on both sides of the cascades um some of the management tools for douglas fir beetle are going to be the same um and uh but the the impacts of Douglas fir beetle uh, might be worse in terms of number of trees killed and the outbreaks might last longer uh, in Eastern Washington. And that's that's primarily due to, um, you know, water being the limiting factor in Eastern Washington. So trees are just sort of naturally under uh, more drought stress uh, in Eastern Washington. And so uh, if we want to start with the the right side here talking about eastern washington that stand density uh an example with the ponderosa pine here um this photo on the left is definitely higher bark beetle risk uh than the photo on the right where the stand has been thinned out so there's less competition stress in these trees um, have more access to the water and nutrients uh, and light the resources they need uh to to defend themselves against bark beetle attack. Um, and as we learned yesterday, the main defense uh, of the trees is a pitching response to kind of push attacking beetles out uh, and get them all stuck up in the pitch. Uh, pine bark beetles are more important in Eastern Washington. Um, in, in Western Washington, if, if you do have pine, uh, which is pretty rare, um, the bark, the pine bark beetles are here, but they tend to be more secondary to, to other stress like uh, drought issues and other damage types. Um, whereas in Eastern Washington, they, they can just respond to those higher stand densities um, and, and 
take more advantage of, of weakened trees. And the east side is a fire adapted ecosystem. And so this sort of thinning um, that I'm showing here in the before and after picture uh, would naturally, if, if we weren't uh, containing fires in most places uh, outside of the wilderness, this would be naturally maintained more open uh, forest by fire. Uh, burning out smaller trees and, and brush, uh, and so reducing the competition. So in Western Washington, it's a very different system, right? So water is not as limiting of a factor. And so, um, you know, I put over here on the east side, if I was giving this talk there, it, it would be uh, thinning and slash management uh, are really important for bark beetle risk. Um, whereas in Western Washington, you know, you, you may be thinning uh, younger stands, so like new reproduction, uh, as the canopy is closing up and those young trees are kind of fighting uh, each other, that's a good time to thin those out. But usually when stands um, grow up into a more mature uh, stage, that thinning is, is not necessarily like a requirement to reduce bark beetle risk. Um, but what tends to be driving bark beetle outbreaks in western Washington is is the amount of breeding material. So we have weather events like windstorms that can create a lot of this uh, fresh, freshly killed trees. Uh, wildfire damage could do something similar. Uh, frost, uh, other, you know, freeze events. And the, basically the beetles can breed up in this material. It's undefended. It doesn't have a pitch response to, to kill attacking bark beetles and they're more successful. Uh, also, drought uh, is a big issue in Western Washington because the the trees, yes, they deal with a summer drought uh, almost every year. Um, but when we get the more severe drought, they're not as well adapted um, to dealing with that. And so you get more beetles breeding in those trees as well. So those weather factors, really important. Um, and that's why, you know, a very long explainer for, I'm talking about bark beetle management in this talk, but I'm gonna spend some time at the beginning here talking about um, things that aren't even alive that damage our trees. So the, the so-called abiotic, uh, this, these are non-living things that damage and kill our trees. So I've already talked about a few of these, except, you know, flooding is a good example of, of something that could kill a whole tree rapidly. Uh, some of these things can be confused for what bark beetle damage looks like, uh, which would be entirely red uh, tree crowns. Um, but also all of these contribute to more activity from bark beetles. So they're, they're all stressing or damaging or uh, in the worst case, killing trees. Um, and then the beetles can use that as, as a resource. So a good example, um, recently in Western Washington was this heat dome that you all remember from June, unless you were somewhere else. Uh, the damage from that in Western Washington was so obvious in some places that we we were actually able to see it from the air uh, and map some of that. And um, here's a Western hemlock that has the heat scorch damage in the branch tips. Um, I'm pointing this out because we actually did not see these heat uh, heat scorch damage um, symptoms in Eastern Washington because trees over there are much more used to the, the higher temperatures in June, um, unlike the west side. So as I mentioned, you know, you can see from this 20 year drought history, that's just the percentage of Washington state uh, each year in a drought condition on the top there um, in different levels of drought. And, and you can see that pretty much every year we have some summer drought. So that's that's normal. The trees are adapted to that. They can deal with it. Um, but unfortunately, what happens in these, you know, more extreme or exceptional years like 2015 and, and 2021, uh, and you can see uh, quite a bit darker color, Western Washington getting hit pretty hard um, with heavier drought issues in 2015. Uh, that There are trees, especially in droughtier sites with well-drained soils, they can't keep up with this um, this kind of longer term lack of water. So we have normal drought, and then we have uh, what I like to call hot drought. You know, I didn't make up that term, other people used it. Uh, but essentially, um, 
normal droughts are limited in, in the level of impact and they tend to kill off the weaker, smaller trees, more vulnerable trees, and that's, that's normal. Uh, then we have more severe droughts can cause more widespread damage. Uh, and these are the ones that actually contribute to increased insect outbreaks and more fire risk. Um, and with climate change um, we're experiencing, so maybe this used to say expecting, uh, but we are experiencing more frequent and intense droughts. And the issue with this is so drought is just a lack of water. Um, but if you add these extreme temperatures on top of that, that is um, desiccating or removing more of the water from the tree, from the tree's needles if we're talking about conifers. And so there's much more demand to replace that water. Um, and so sometimes the, the trees can't keep up with that. And I'm, I'm not just making that up. This is, this is in the research. Uh, and, and we're expecting that these effects as time goes on, uh, on the fringes of a tree's range. Um, so think of that, that interface between forest and more open dry uh, um, areas where trees aren't growing. Um, drier well-drained soil sites, that's where we're going to start to lose more trees on those on those edges in lower elevation, hotter areas. Um, so, okay, so if you see dead trees, you know, I talked about yesterday, these uh, completely red crowns mean a tree died quickly. Uh, there's probably bark beetles uh, in a lot of these trees. Um, but we know in all these photos here that drought was the driving factor. And in some cases, as you can see here, removing the bark uh, to look for bark beetle galleries didn't find any, and that's not uncommon, um, and didn't even find wood borers, uh, which are another group of beetles I'll talk about tomorrow, which tend to respond to, um, respond to drought stress. Um, so these are things to look for to identify drought, differentiate it from, from bark beetles, um, but that can be very difficult to do. But I just put this up here so that you, you're aware that, you know, it's not, not just bark beetles that are causing these issues, but they tend to work in tandem. And, and why, uh, why aren't we seeing bark beetles in this example tree where the, the bark was removed? And, and why aren't they using this tree that has, has died? You know, if, if it gets blown over in a windstorm, they, use it? Why, why not here with drought? Uh, there was an experiment done in Europe with the European spruce bark beetle, um, and they put in a lot of time and effort to actually cover the trees um, to exclude rain. Uh, and so the, the tree on the left was covered all the time, didn't get any rain. Uh, then they had a set of trees that got the rain half of the time, and then one that was just normal amount of rain. And so those, those normal trees, of course, they were able to keep up a good pitch response and repel the beetles from getting into the tree. Uh, this one that was sort of half droughty condition, the, the beetles were, were happy with that um, because the defenses were compromised, uh, but there was still enough moisture in the tree that their, their larvae uh, were going to do better uh, and survive. And then the trees that were so heavily drought stressed uh, the material, the inner bark that the bark beetles are going after the phloem is just too dry uh, for them to even accept it and want to lay eggs in there. So that's that's just kind of explaining maybe that it's it's not always, drought is not always good for the bark beetles if it becomes too extreme. Um, okay, so just want to front load here um, with management of bark beetles in Western Washington. Uh, and also in Eastern Washington, prevention is what we want to emphasize. So uh, tree vigor is essentially anything you can do to give the tree more room to grow, more access to those resources um, that are used for defense and growth, of course. And so they can defend against attack, you know, keep the beetles from getting in. Uh, if the beetles do get in and do some damage, they can recover. Uh, from that damage or maybe flush uh, if larvae are growing under the bark um, in a small area they can flush that with defensive chemicals and kill those and just have a small uh, part of the tree damaged. Um, sorry skipped ahead there. Keep in mind that those are these are correlated with diameter growth so if your trees are growing larger in diameter the main stem uh, 
that's an indication that they're vigorous. Um, and so the, the thinning that you may do uh, in Western Washington, I, I wanna emphasize that you should consult with a forester, WSU Extension, a DNR has quite a few uh, stewardship foresters or service foresters that are there to assist because your site is really important. Uh, how many trees that site can carry. And, um, but if you're doing some thinning, then it's, I would emphasize just generally, you wanna thin from below. Um, so you're keeping your more vigorous trees that are in the in the upper canopy, the more dominant trees that have more green branches. Those are the most likely to successfully uh, defend themselves. Remove those suppressed uh, trees that are in the understory, the weakened or damaged trees, wounded trees that are all uh, more bark beetle targets. Um, and then if you're looking in young stands, uh, it, it's important if, if they're crowded and branches are really starting to overlap that it might be time for uh, a, a, what we call a pre-commercial thinning, so in younger stands. This one's really important. Uh, retain uh, native and local drought tolerant species that are suited for the site. And that's, that's where a forester would come in if you're gonna make planting decisions. Um, and then address the understory vegetation. This is something that's really important uh, in Western Washington. Um, just remember that everything growing in the understory is also using water. Uh, and if, if those aren't natural plants that you want as part of that forest ecosystem, it may be a good idea uh, to remove some of that competing vegetation, especially if it doesn't really belong there. Uh, okay, and so just some specifics. Uh, yesterday I talked about these secondary bark beetles, so just a little refresher. Um, these are two in Douglas fir. Uh, but of course, I talked about ones in Western Red Cedar and Hemlock um, as well. These are shorter galleries. Uh, so again, the egg gallery is about oh, one to four inches in length uh, to differentiate it from Douglas fir beetle, uh, which is more like five to 18 inches in length. And, and symptoms of secondary bark beetles are just parts of the tree crown, the top, or just individual branches turning red. Uh, so managing issues with secondary bark beetles is, is a little tricky because there's not too many things you can do directly uh, or would need to do. I just want to point out how they work. Um, and so in normal years, they like smaller diameter material. And so they're breeding in broken branches on the ground, slash piles, any fresh green material they can lay eggs in. Uh, and that's how they maintain these low uh, endemic populations that don't cause any issues. They just stay in that slash and branch material. Um, so, you know, they're acting as good guys, kind of the cleanup crew and the weakened suppressed trees, you know, these young trees that are suppressed. Um, that's where the secondary bark beetles are active. Uh, what, what can happen though, is when we have droughts, um, that creates a new food source for them that are these, you know, living trees that are, are now open for attack essentially. And, um, and so we'll see these secondary bark beetles uh, having outbreaks uh, and increasing the number of uh, trees that are damaged, living trees that are damaged from these. And so I'm not suggesting in Western Washington that you, you know, control all your slash piles, and but just keep in mind that synergy between drought and uh, these secondary bark beetles. All right, so in the intro slide, if you guessed Douglas fir beetle, uh, that was the one that I was talking about. So for Western Washington, in terms of um, what what's a major tree killer, if you've got Douglas fir, which is super common, of course, is Douglas fir beetle. Um, just a refresher here from yesterday of what kind of signs and symptoms to look for uh, to identify Douglas fir beetle. And a little bit more about the outbreak cycle. Uh, yesterday, I talked kind of about the life cycle, but this is how the whole population operates. Um, in normal years, we got a low level population that they're kind of kicking around and scattered blow down a tree here, tree there, or root disease pockets. They love to hang out in those because that's just a steady plot supply of, of new dead trees they can breed in. Uh, what can happen though is you you have these disturbance events like windstorms um, that create a lot of downed trees that they can breed in and they build up in that stuff 
might take a year or two uh, to do that because they have a year long life cycle. And then that can lead into these outbreaks where the, the blowdown creates a big enough population that they can then overwhelm uh, defenses of even the vigorous trees. Um, so having that vigor improved growth that I was talking about, that's not a guarantee with a beetle like Doug fir beetle that you're not going to have damage because if, if you've got literally tens of thousands of beetles flying around, um, they can eventually overwhelm the pitch response of the tree and you end up with these dry uh, piles of red boring dust instead of a pitch response. Whoops. Uh, so this is this is what that boring dust or frass looks like with Doug fir. Uh, a tree defending itself has these runny pitch streams. Um, and so those typically uh, west side, we're talking one to two years of this kind of damage, these group kills of live Doug fir. Uh, and that's because the healthy trees, eventually that's what they're forced to attack at that point. That's all that's out there. Uh, they can become a sink. So beetles go in, uh, but more beetles don't come out because the healthier trees are able to kill them off. Uh, and so it just kind of goes back into that low level again. Um, so that's that's what you're up against. And, and so things to avoid, uh, and this would go for any uh, tree species that you're concerned about bark beetle attacks. Um, I mentioned the tree vigor, of course, but also you want to be aware of things you're doing that compromise the tree vigor. So if you're uh, putting in roads or in construction project, logging operations, anything that's going to wound trees or compress the soil flooding uh, that are going to compromise root function, that's going to stress the tree. Um, and so, you know, you can't control drought, but these are things that you can control. So trying to avoid uh, injury and stress, and that can attract the beetles, uh, but also make them more successful if the tree's defenses are compromised. Uh, so Douglas fir beetle is one of the few ones where we can we can take some direct action. Um, and so I've been talking a lot about this blowdown, and that's a major driver for Doug fir beetle outbreaks. Um, so that first bullet point there, um, if, if you have five green dead, so green dead just means they all came down in a single year. Uh, like in that top picture. If they're over 10 inch diameter, uh, that's diameter breast height, which would essentially be like four and a half feet off the ground. Um, and all these trees would qualify as being bigger than that. If you have five or more of that size material per acre, uh, then you can expect to see some, some bigger impacts from the beetles coming out of that stuff and killing nearby live trees. Um, so it takes about two, and they've done a study on, on this um, in, re, in the real field, and about two down trees will generate enough Douglas fir beetle to kill one live tree nearby. So if you had five down, uh, that translates to roughly two to three uh, standing dead trees killed. And so depending on your risk tolerance, you know, having two trees per acre die uh, all at once may be you don't want to go higher than that. Um, and so what you want to do in that case is salvage this material before the beetles come out of it or before they go into it. Uh, the nice thing about Doug fir beetle is that you have time to accomplish this. So you want to salvage that before two springs pass. Uh, so essentially, based on Doug fir beetle life cycle, if this stuff, whoops, if this stuff came down in, um, in November, December, um, it's going to sit there, stay fresh for the beetles to come into it in April, May timeframe. Uh, and then one year later, that second spring after the storm, that's when they're going to come out the brood that you're worried about. Uh, so you have those before that second spring to remove that stuff. Keep in mind, you know, what's blown down. Uh, this was a coastal area, a clear cut on the right here. Um, got a big edge effect from the wind in 2009. Uh, most of this was Western hemlock in this particular stand, and hemlock doesn't have a bark beetle that breeds up like Doug fir beetles. So just keep in mind that we're talking about Douglas fir here. Okay. Um, other tool that you have, I, I mentioned yesterday, uh, a repellent or anti-aggregant pheromone that uh, a lot of bark beetle species produce. And they use this uh, 
um, to to control competition with other beetles. So when a tree is full of beetles, it does them no good to have more beetles arriving. Um, so they'll actually produce this repellent pheromone naturally, and and it's been synthesized, and you can purchase this. Um, and it put them out in these plastic, uh, what they call bubble caps. Um, and each yellow dot uh, on this example stand, they're evenly spaced. Um, you're stapling these to trees or fence posts or bushes or anything that's out there and essentially creating a grid of this um, that emit the pheromone and create a cloud across the stand. And so any newly arriving beetles flying through here will think all of these trees are already full of beetles and they'll just continue flying uh, and, and move on to the next area, hopefully not your neighbor's stand. Um, but this is a tool you can use uh, for individual trees if you're concerned about high value trees in the yard or park or something, uh, or protect whole uh, stands. And uh, you probably only wanna do this during outbreak uh, periods when you suspect bark beetle numbers are up. It's not something that you want to just do every year as a preventative. Um, but of course, if, if you do think of this as a need, please contact me um, or another entomologist to get advice on proper timing, um, which is really important, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that today. Um, another important one, if you have grand fur, um, typically a lot of private landowners don't have noble fur, but if you have grand fur, the fur engraver can be a, a major impact, uh, especially during drought periods, because it does, it does respond and build up populations. Um, following drought stress. So just to review from yesterday, uh, things to look for, that, that horizontal egg gallery uh, that parallel to the ground if the tree is standing and uh, adult with the scooped out uh, rear abdomen, um, if you remember that. So management for fur engraver is gonna be a little bit more tricky. Um, again, because they're, they're following that, that drought issue, um, you can, Remove and treat wind throw within a year, very similar to Douglas fir beetle. That's That can be important with this one. Um, it doesn't really use attractant pheromones um, to bring in more beetles and mass attack individual trees. So it tends to um, sometimes have these patchy attacks where you, you might just get a section of the tree that was wounded by, by beetle activity, but then the tree survives. And you can see here it healed over that wound over time. Um, I'll mention this in a later slide, uh, talking about green attack trees. Um, essentially, that means that you're, you know, I mentioned yesterday, if you see a red crown tree like this, it's very likely the beetles aren't in that anymore. That tree was probably killed the previous summer, um, and it took that long for the tree to dry out and turn red, and so beetles have left that tree. Um, not always a guarantee. Um, but what you'd want to do if you if you were motivated to remove trees to get bark beetles off of the property, uh, you would want to be targeting those trees that are still green, uh, but show signs of attack, uh, like the pitch streaming or the piles of red boring dust, um, those indicators and, and knowing the beetles are probably in those trees. Um, knowing if you have root disease with bark beetles is really important because um, that may mean you're not having an outbreak. Uh, it just means that bark beetles are hanging out in your root disease pocket, which is normal. And so you don't necessarily need to manage the bark beetles, but more focus on managing the root disease. Um, so consult with a, with a forest pathologist on that one. Uh, if you're thinking about thinning and root disease, it's important to know um, what root disease you've got, okay? Uh, so direct, you know, I talked about prevention, uh, uh, earlier, so this is direct attack essentially on, on bark beetles in Western Washington. Um, manage those large inputs of fresh dead trees. So we're talking, especially Douglas fir is important with this and also grand fir. Um, keep in mind, just one down tree isn't enough to cause a real big issue. Um, if you do have pine, that's something to consider. We do have pine engravers in Western Washington. Uh, and it's, it's rare, but I've seen a few issues. So if you're thinning a lot of pine, uh, ponderosa, lodgepole, shore pine, that kind of thing, um, definitely get in touch with an entomologist to see if you need to, 
to do anything with that material. Um, removal of the of the red, I already talked about this with fur engraver, those red crown trees may not be needed. Um, I get a lot of questions about that. You know, do I have to get these trees off of the property uh, to get the beetles out of here? And um, you want to sample uh, under the bark and look and see if beetles are still in those trees. Uh, one thing you can look for is these exit holes uh, and you can see how tiny they are. Uh, but there's multiple perfectly round exit holes uh, that show you that the beetles have already left the tree, uh, the new adults. And so that's that's a good indicator. If you're in an outbreak and you know you've got an issue going on, you can do this sanitation salvage, um, removing infested trees. Again, look for those green attack trees uh, can be challenging. Uh, monitor the surviving trees. Um, to see if you have new signs of attack. And for Douglas fir beetle, you can use that repellent pheromone, the MCH is what that one's called. And then pesticides, um, they are good for preventing attack and protecting trees from attack. If you already have bark beetles in the tree, you're seeing pitching and exit holes or, or frass, uh, the pesticide application isn't going to save the tree at that point, it's likely already too late. Um, and of course, pesticides are, are expensive and difficult to use. So really only appropriate for like, a, um, you know, high value trees, again, a park situation or, or yard trees. Um, and of course, you want to consult with an entomologist so that you're, you know, kind of like with the pheromone application, uh, pesticide application, the timing is super, super important. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail on that. So, you know, along with management, and I've just got a like a minute left here um, before the question period, monitoring is really important because, you know, I mentioned, hey, if you're in an outbreak, you should do these things. Well, how do you know, you know, if, if you don't have a lot of trees on your property that are dying? Uh, one way you can do that is to access our aerial survey data. Uh, we fly every forested acre of the state every year. Uh, and produce, you can see these, the flight line map here, we, you know, it's kind of like mowing the lawn, we fly it on a grid pattern. And we produce these maps that are kind of a close up of your area, you can just download it as a, as a PDF, uh, and view what's been going on around your property uh, in recent years on the, those maps. So it's freely available information, we, we do do some monitoring uh, for Bark beetles, it, it tends to focus more on detecting invasives or non-natives that we'll talk about in this session on Thursday. Um, and also native range expansions. This is an example of a, a bark beetle of the California five-spined Ips that's native to California, uh, as the name suggests, and Oregon. Um, but recent in recent years, we've been detecting it up. You see uh, the range here it conveniently stopped at the Columbia River. Um, but recently we've detected it in the red dots here, more moving up into Washington. Um, so the aerial survey data, the trap monitoring data, and all kinds of wonderful disease research that our pathologists are doing, uh, all of that stuff is reported every year in our highlights report that you can get off the DNR Forest Health website and and it has information in the back of that report about how to access the aerial survey maps uh how to contact us for help um and just the general trends of, of what's been up and what's been down um and so I'll, I'll leave you with that and uh knowing that half an hour for bark field management is is a, a quick quick and dirty overview uh and it's really important if you if you want to take action to consult with a forester or or someone like myself hey thank you awesome thanks glenn appreciate that we got a lot of really um really good and and, and thoughtful questions from people that i can tell i've been out on the ground dealing with this um so we'll like i said well like we usually do we'll, we'll stay on until um uh, as late as one if we need to just working through these questions um so the first one we have is from John, and he asks, uh, when you remove bark to determine whether a tree is infested with beetles, if you don't find any evidence, what do you conclude? No infestation or sampled the wrong place, and what do you do next? 
Yeah, and, and that's one that I struggle with a lot because the most convenient place, of course, you're not going to necessarily cut down the tree to sample the top. Uh, so usually you're pulling that bark off at eye level. Um, and the major tree killing bark beetles are going to be in that area of the tree. Uh, so like with Douglas fir beetle, uh, that's where you're going to see it. And so if you pull that off and you don't see any tunneling activity or it's just wood borers um, and not the distinctive bark beetle pattern, then you can't make a 100% conclusion that the bark beetles aren't involved because they may be in the upper crown in the smaller diameter parts of the tree, especially these secondary bark beetles that I'm talking about. Um, but usually, you know, also if you know the history of the area, you know, there's been recent droughts uh, or any other factor or something that's been going on like flooding, um, you could conclude that the bark beetles didn't kill this tree, uh, that they weren't the primary tree killer, but you could also just be missing them. So unfortunately that's possible as well. Yeah, and the, one of the dilemmas I'm always faced with is, and I'm sure you are too, is uh, you see maybe some exit holes, but you can't put the bark back on the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and so the question is, to, yeah. you know, yeah. is it worth it to look underneath? Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up seeing exit holes because that's something that's come up quite a bit with Douglas fir in, in, in Western Washington is there are other insects that feed in the bark so right. they're not they're not in the in the part of the bark that we're worried about in the inner bark where you can damage the tree they're in the outer bark and they make exit holes too so i can walk up to any douglas fir and find little holes in the bark the tree is perfectly healthy looking the branches are leaves are green there's nothing wrong with this tree uh and people um and some um you know, arborists maybe will kind of jump to the conclusion that that's bark beetles because there's exit holes. And and like you said, you don't want to remove the bark because you're wounding a healthy tree, right? Yeah. Uh, so I just say, look, if it's just exit holes and you don't have any red foliage, uh, you don't have any dead trees on your property, uh, it's just exit holes. That doesn't really tell you anything, unfortunately. Now, if you know you've you've got a dead tree, uh, it's red, uh, or the needles have fallen off, and you see those exit holes, that's that's useful information. You you know that beetles have left the tree. Um, but as far as if that's the only thing you have to ID bark beetles, I, I'm I'm dubious. Hmm. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so Eric asked, do the down trees that are hosts for Doug fir beetle have to be Doug fir, or can other species? Um, that are downed also host the beetle. Yeah, um, or I should say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just Douglas fir beetle in Douglas fir, conveniently named. Right. Um, Douglas fir beetle can, in eastern Washington, can attack western large. Um, but for the most part, it, and you might get fir engraver, uh, that other bark beetle I talked about in grand fir, uh, might try to get in Doug fir, but for the most part, it's just Douglas fir um for that beetle now if you have other tree species down like hemlock or cedar uh sicka spruce I, I wouldn't worry about those as being sources of bark beetle outbreaks um i would worry about the true furs though like grand fur and pacific silver fur um, Tamara asks, uh, what is the downside, uh, if any, I guess, of using the pheromone as a preventative? Yeah, the, the downside, there isn't really like an environmental cost, you know, like if you're spraying pesticides on a tree every year, um, there's an environmental cost to that. And you might be killing on target insects. Um, the pheromone is, it's a natural mimic of the actual bark beetle pheromones is basically harmless it is regulated as a pesticide um and so applying it you know every year as a preventative it's it's not really recommended uh, because essentially you're using a pesticide when you don't have a target um but 
on the other hand, if, if you have a very high value tree, then Doug Furbio loves bigger, older Doug Fur. Um, and, you know, this is like the prize tree next to the house or in a park or something. Um, putting a few of those bubble caps out every year, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, because you never know, right, when that year of attack might be. Um, but as far as treating whole stands, um, it's going to be really expensive to do that every year. And, and also it take, you know, takes a couple days to, to treat 20 acres. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. But yeah, for a single tree, I think I could, it's probably cheaper than paying to have it removed if it's close to the house. Yep. Yep. And if, yep. if you are interested in using the MCH for Douglas for beetle, that forest service has an excellent publication about methods to apply it. Um, so get in touch with me and I can get you that. And they do have single tree application instructions. Nice. Uh, Kit asks, do you, does, uh, I'm sorry, do intentionally made habitat piles provide a growth opportunity for beetles? Oh, I love this question. And we need Ken Bevis here, the wildlife yes. guy. <laughs> you guys can <laughs> duel it out. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is fun because, so Ken gives his talk about wildlife and he's always talking about those piles and how great the piles are. And, uh, and he always gets this question and, and I do as well. And, and the answer is, in Western Washington, it's really not an issue. Um, like I mentioned with these secondary Doug fir uh, bark beetles, they will build up in those Doug fir slash piles, uh, but they, they never reach that population level that's gonna be super destructive. Um, and I did mention if we have a drought that you're gonna see more damage uh, from the secondaries because the living trees are stressed by drought. But the slash piles, they're just a source for beetles. Uh, they're not like compromising the defenses of the, they're not producing enough beetles to do a mass attack and overwhelm healthy trees, right? It's, it's the combination of slash piles and drought. Uh, so if you, if you were concerned about it at all, you know, during a drought year um, and you're creating, maybe you wanna limit the number of piles you're making for wildlife. And, and again, it's kind of like that five tree per acre threshold I was talking about. You know, if you're making, you know, 20 slash piles per acre, uh, maybe you don't need, maybe aren't there aren't that many squirrels that need that many piles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you could limit it during a drought year, but in Eastern Washington, um, the slash is more of an issue with pine. Um, but even there, uh, making a couple piles in an acre isn't really going to provide enough beetles to be an issue. Nice. So I, I approve of piles. Good. Ken, Ken would be happy to hear that. Yeah. He, may, yeah. he may be on. I don't know. <laughs> um, Scott asked a similar question uh, about snags and how many per acre would cause an outbreak. It sounds yeah. like maybe that five number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the snag question is such a good one because I, I, years ago, I got called out to a, a site where they were deliberately making snags by girdling the trees. Um, and, and they had done a lot of trees uh, kind of over that five per acre over a wide area. Uh, and there was a Doug fir beetle outbreak. They, they saw the group kill of live trees kind of all over the landscape in this area. And that's why they called me, you know, they're like, did we cause this outbreak? Hmm. And, um, you know, the answer was, I'm not sure because the outbreak was happening in other places as well. Right. Sure. So it was just bad timing. Like you already had a lot of Doug fir beetle around here because of other factors, a windstorm recently. Uh, and now you have these standing trees contributing. Um, but I've heard uh, from other entomologists with more experience that Doug fir beetle actually prefers stuff on the ground, uh, that snags aren't as attractive. Hmm. So I wonder uh, why. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, an interesting question. Uh, it, it might be because they still have kind of a passive pitch response because they're still uh, pulling water. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, let's see, uh, where was I? Uh, Maeve asks, is there concern that Doug for beetle outbreaks will become more frequent and last longer under future drought conditions? Mm, yeah, um, that's a good one. Cause I, 
I would say by the by the textbook, by experience, the answer would be no, uh, because Doug fir beetle outbreaks tend to be much more driven by the wind throw, uh, or wildfire damage creating a lot of dead trees in a in a single season. So you get this big pulse of beetle population, tending not to be driven by drought. That being said, uh, I think drought is having a major impact on Douglas fir. And if drought continues to get worse, that will continue to get worse. Um, but a lot of other issues are involved with that. The, you know, the secondary bark beetles are getting more of an advantage. Um, I don't think Doug fir beetle really likes those drought stress trees very much, but between the secondary species and the wood borers hmm. uh, and just straight up drought itself and also drought can exacerbate root disease right? Uh, if it's on the site. And so I, I think, yes, Doug fir's going to be uh, in trouble in some areas, especially droughty spots, you know, well-drained soils. Right. Uh, yeah. And, you know, just so I don't forget back to this girdling snag question. Um, that's what I told these guys that were girdling trees. I said, you know, if you want to have 10 an acre, uh, just create three each year, three years. Uh, because as long as you're not giving the beetles all this food at once, you can make as many snags as you want. Just don't make too many in each season. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so Terry asked kind of a, sounds like a bit of a mechanical question of how does the adult beetle actually get into a stressed tree to lay eggs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, sorry, I kind of gl glanced over that today, covered it yesterday, hopefully. Um, so the, the adult beetle, you know, they're attracted to the trees by the, the volatiles that a dying or stressed tree uh, makes. And so they find the tree uh, and we sort of call the pioneer tree uh, and that pioneer beetle will drill through the bark and it, normally a healthy tree would have a pitching response and push that beetle out and that would be the end of it uh, if the tree isn't having that pitch response very well then the beetle gets into the inner bark where the phloem layer is uh, that interface between the bark and the sapwood that's where all the sugar is that the beetles want and so it, usually it's a female initiating that pioneer attack. If she gets in there and likes the taste of the phloem sugar, it's, she'll, she'll attract a mate uh, with a pheromone. He'll come in, they mate, she'll lay eggs in that phloem layer. Um, and then the larvae take off and they're the ones that are killing the tree by mining out all of the, the phloem layer. Uh, if the tree does have a healthy pitch response and there's thousands and thousands of beetles, say from a big blowdown, uh, they will like a siege on a castle. Uh, you know, the first wave dies in the pitch and then they send in the second wave and they die. And then there's a third wave. Uh, and eventually if you have enough soldiers, uh, you break into the castle, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, no defense anymore. Uh, so that's what we call a mass attack. Looks like Maeve had another question. Is there a way that infested trees can be dealt with on site? Will cutting them up into pieces allow them to dry out enough? Yeah. Um, if if there's already beetles in the in the tree, um, chopping up into firewood lengths um, can speed the drying process. Uh, but the issue is depending on where the beetles are in their development. Mm. Uh, so if you're already closer to spring or, or in the winter, uh, those beetles, a lot of them are adults at that point. They're, they're inside this tree and they're waiting for warm weather to fly out. If you cut them up into firewood and leave them as rounds, the beetles will still come out. They're, they're fine. Um, if you're cutting them earlier, like in that summertime when the infestation has just started, uh, then that phloem layer, the larvae you're mining in, that starts drying and then they don't make it to adulthood. And so that's a good strategy. Uh, I, I always advise people if you are going to uh, cut up into shorter lengths uh, of a large diameter tree and you 
plan is to have it dry out, it's got beetles in it, I would advise you split. If you're using it for firewood anyway, to split right away because then the bark falls off faster. Um, but yes, on the flip side of that, if you have a Douglas fir tree or a, a grand fir tree on the ground with the bark on uh, and it's whole, not cut up, it's not going to dry out. It'll be fine for a year. And I get a lot of questions from people about debarking. And mm -hmm. I think it's more of a, it's just so much work. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. really the preventative there. Agreed. It probably would be effective though. Correct. It, it, yes, it is. It is effective. Anything you can do to get, you know, expose the phloem to air and drying. Um, but it is a lot of work and, you know, people wrap in plastic um, mm. to cook the beetles in there. And it's, it's just kind of elaborate. And I, I tell people, you know, unless you're talking about those five trees or more, if it's just one tree, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, it. It might fill up with Doug fir beetle, but you're not going to, that one tree isn't going to produce enough beetles to, to kill anything nearby. Right. Um, yeah. And if you're in Eastern Washington though, and we're talking about a pine tree, you can have one single ponderosa tree could produce enough pine engravers to to kill a lot of trees nearby so totally different system but I, I wouldn't worry too much about Doug for a small amount yeah probably better things to spend your time on on your <laughs> tree farm in, in western Washington <laughs> agreed yes yeah um so let's see looks like Joan got her question answered about the aerial map there's a link right there um Elliot asked um, sorry if this has been covered and I missed it. Um, Xylotrechus longitarsis. I don't know if you're looking at the chat too. I hope I didn't totally butcher that name. I, that, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yes. Does that go after dug firs and other species that are still alive or do they look for dead trees? So I'm familiar with that, that species. That's a longhorned wood borer. I'm going to talk about oh. that group in general tomorrow. Okay. Um, that specific species, I don't like off the top of my head know anything about what hosts it prefers um but those are native beetles and you're right they tend to go after trees that are already dead or dying uh they tend to be secondary to to other issues especially drought um and even uh trees that are killed by bark beetles uh you have these wood borers coming in at, at the same time uh, because they're also attracted to to dying tree smells um but yeah they they're i like to call them the cleanup crew mm. you know they they carry fungi with them and they chew holes in the in the sapwood and they really jump start the decay process um so they're really important part of the ecosystem um, right yeah there's really only one i'll talk about it tomorrow there's there's one species of a flat-headed fur borer uh it's another wood borer that can get more aggressive in Doug fur. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We could talk more on that tomorrow. I was going to guess based on the name. It probably doesn't mean anything after the fact. Maybe people don't believe me that it was a long horned beetle because they have the most interesting names. Yes. Yes. And the and whole xylo xylo thing, right? That's yeah. uh, something to do with trees. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. So Janine, uh, you kind of touched on this already. Maybe there's nothing to add, but she as to the high number of slash piles, you know, near clear cutting operations, mm -hmm. um, would those breed uh, bark beetles? And you've, you kind of touched on no. in Western yep. Washington, not mm -hmm. being as big of a concern. Yeah. Yeah. Western Washington, you can see these huge slash piles, you know, like the size of a house. Um, and yes, there are bark beetles in there. In fact, if you were a bark beetle collector uh, and you wanted to find all kinds of different bark beetle species that'd be a good place to go mm -hmm. uh, so they're definitely in there uh, but what's in there are these minor secondary species that like small diameter material dead branches it's not going to be douglas fir beetle or any any major tree killer threat uh, it's going to be the the secondaries um, and so there's no there's no management need to control that material because the beetles tend to stay in the slash uh they just move to another slash pile somewhere else uh 
or maybe they go deeper inside the same pile uh, as that material stays moist inside. Mm. Um, and so they, the only risk factor with those is when you have a drought, a severe drought, then those beetles might go to the drought stress trees and start killing tops and branches. Um, but again, if you removed all the slash piles, uh, they do fly. And so right. they might, they might just come yeah. from somewhere else. So it's right. not really worth anyone's time. Um, Eastern Washington, uh, again, slash piles with pine, uh, something you really want to watch out for. Right. So, so we had a couple of requests on where to buy uh, the MCH. And it sounds like, did you, I think you had a place or you said people could reach out to you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I can, uh, if, if they want to email me, um, I can give you the, the publication on how to apply it and also a, a list of some suppliers. Um, and I just threw your email in the chat for folks. Well, uh, you want me to put my email in chat? Is that what you say? Oh, I did. I just threw it in there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Suzanne, your question about thinning on slopes is a, a little outside the scope of what we're talking about today, but I do hope that some folks uh, have reached out to you because uh, it is a, it's an interesting topic. Let's see. Steve asks, how does the entry hole of a beetle differ from an exit hole or do they? Mm, mm, yeah, I like that one. Uh, the entry holes are really hard to find and uh, because they go into the crevices. So you have those bark furrows where it's a little bit thinner. That's where they're targeting the entry because um, it's less bark to drill through. And so if the tree isn't having a, a pitch response, um, you may not see them. If, if it is, then that's where that's, you're going to see the pitch coming out uh, in pine. It would be like a glob, like popcorn uh, in furs. It'll be runny. Uh, or if the tree has been killed, it might just be a pile of red sawdust, like I showed a couple pictures for, for Doug Fur Beetle. So the, the, red, uh, the red boring dust, that's, that's an entry point. Um, the exit holes... So I don't know if you're looking at the slides here, but those are going to be perfectly round. Um, they're going to come through any part of the bark. So here's the furrow. The, the, the exit holes will come through the main part of the bark, the plates, what do you want to get, or the furrows, doesn't matter. And there's going to be a lot. So if the beetles were successful, this is the brood. So all the babies, there might have been one male and female in this area, but you know, you have dozens of offspring coming out um, and there's no boring dust associated with the exit holes. Um, so let me see if I can go back to the, this is what I'm talking about with boring dust. Where are you? Right here. Hmm. Uh, so that's, that's an entry hole right there. So the beetles working in there and they're cleaning out their tunnels and kicking that sawdust out. And these pitch streams, the top of each one of these pitch streams is a entry hole as well. All right, well, we got one question left in two minutes until one, so this works out. Um, aside from the aesthetic value of the holes in the edges, uh, are bark beetles causing much damage to the potential lumber? Uh, no, and yesterday I talked about the ambrosia beetles, which are related to bark beetles, and they go directly into the sapwood and cause a black staining. Um, those, so if you leave trees out in the woods with the bark on for weeks, months, um, they'll fill with those ambrosia beetles. Uh, so if you are using bark beetle killed trees for lumber, the bark beetles aren't going into the sapwood that you're using for lumber. So it's not an issue. The, the main thing is if you're salvaging beetle kill, you get it out of there soon because the beetles carry decay fungi. Uh, and they also bring in a blue stain that, that they actually feed on. They inoculate the wood with the blue stain. And so you start getting this rot set in uh, within months. Um, so get it out of there quickly, get the bark off. So you don't have the ambrosia beetle staining uh, in there. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The dark beetles aren't aren't hurting the wood. Perfect. Well, that was the last question, um, and we will close out and rejoin tomorrow. A lot of thank yous in the chat, Glenn. So really appreciate hey, you doing this. That one was uh, very informative. So okay, glad glad it worked out. I was a little worried about how, how I would make it thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, and for context for some folks, you you often do this class over the course of you know two and a half hours or more. Right. So right. Yeah. <laughs> So it's impressive. Okay, Appreciate good. it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we will see you tomorrow. Okay. Sounds good.